My name is Jessica Bloomer. I am the program director for the continuing education uh, program in the University of Cincinnati Education and Research Center. Thanks to those of you who were able to join us for this webinar today. Um, I will be sending out an evaluation link after the webinar ends, um, as well as the, a PDF of the slides, so you don't need to um, rapidly take notes during this or anything. Um, and once you complete the program evaluation, you will automatically get emailed a certificate of completion. And um, you may need to check your junk folder for that. Sometimes it gets directed there, um, but that usually sends about 10 minutes or so after you complete the evaluation. And I think that is all for me. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to our speakers and I'll let you introduce yourselves. All right, well, thank you very much and thank everyone for being here. Glad you guys are here today. Um, my name is Don Finan and I'll be one of the presenters today. I'll, I'll start off the presentation and then I'm gonna be handing things off to Bill Murphy and Greg Flammy as we go along that covered some different topics. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Northern Colorado. Bill and Greg are scientists with Stevenson and Stevenson Research and Consulting, otherwise known as SASRAC. And um, I think we'll get started. So to begin with, we're gonna be talking about impulsive noise uh, trying to understand what impulsive noise is, how to measure it, how do we assess it, um, what does that mean in general, and well, what is impulsive noise? That's a good question. Um, it's it's boom, it's pop, it's bang, it's all these things basically. It's short duration, high amplitude sounds um, that can occur from literally popping balloons, hammer strikes, explosions, etc. And let's start off with a little bit about just noise and sound in general, though, um, before we get into specifically aspects of impulse noise. Let, <clears throat> excuse me, let's talk about continuous noise as a contrast. Continuous noise is basically kind of time stable um, sound. It's sound that is continuous. It's, it's occurring over a longer period of time, at least a second or longer than that. Fans, blowers, generators, pumps, and that are continuously running can produce continuous noise. Um, to measure continuous noise, a sound level meter works quite well, actually. Uh, you're going to take samples over a long period of time, relatively long period of time, to get that continuous noise measurement. Impact noise is a type of impulsive noise. An impact noise is essentially a single collision of something. A hammer strike, for example. So a mass in motion with a second mass. Usually this is occurring at a, a shorter time frame, a lot of shorter time frame, less than a second. Um, it has maybe repeats, but it's going to repeat itself less than one time, uh, no more than once per second. So the duration is going to be short, um, hammering, metal forging, punch press, even drums, musical drums are going to produce impact noise. Next is impulse noise. So impulse noise is basically an, usually produced by an explosive type of event. This is gunshot noise or explosions. These are you're usually way less than a second in duration and typically way high in terms of peak level, very, very large peak levels in terms of sound pressure levels, maybe over, well over 130 dB. So um, can also be defined as a change in sound pressure of 40 decibels or more within half of a second. Gunfire, fireworks, explosions, these all produce impulse um, sorry, impulse noise itself, which is again, a form of impulsive noise. We're gonna put impulse and impact noise together themselves in, in terms of this combination. Um, they've got some serious, or, or some features to them that are very, very similar overall in terms of their waveforms. And that's where I'm gonna hand it off to Bill Murphy to start talking a little bit about what are these waveforms? What do they look like? And how can we get around measuring them? Thank you, Don. Let's go to the next slide. So in the development of damage risk criteria for hearing loss and uh, noise, we've assumed at NIOSH, at OSHA, other agencies that have developed these damage risk criteria, we've assumed that it's continuous noise like what Don showed in the, one of the first slides. And that would be akin to what you see in this image of what's called the background Gaussian noise. But that's not all of what we end up with. There are going to be impulses or impacts that can be embedded 
in that noise, in that background continuous noise. And these high level transients are things that make it complex. And the, the damage risk criteria are assuming that we're, or at least the one for continuous noise that we deal with from OSHA, from NIOSH, it's assuming that it's continuous noise and that it doesn't have these kinds of characteristics to it. You know, there's a, a duration, how long it lasts. That's the orange portion that you see with the little arrows. You could have peak pressures that are showing up, uh, very high levels. And then how often do these peaks occur in the impulse? So we've done some work at NIOSH in collaboration with um, researchers at the State University of New York in Plattsburgh and have developed an approach using what's called kurtosis. And that'll be in our next slide. You see here, there are three different types of, of noises. There's a Gaussian noise called spinning noise. And then what you see or what you're listening to is that, that spinning noise. And if you look at the portion that's highlighted, there is a dashed red line and a blue line. Go ahead and let that play. This is a stamping factory. And you can see where the red line now is separated from the blue line. We'll go ahead and let that one play now too. There's, oops, back up one, please. There we go. Uh, so what is happening is we get to higher and higher amounts of kurtosis. We have more uh, departure from that continuous noise background and that changes the risk. It actually makes it uh, more risky to be exposed to that type of noise. And this is the sort of thing that is a, a very uh, hot topic, I guess is a good term to use, a very hot topic for research that's going on, that we've, we've got data on this. Uh, Greg and myself uh, have been involved in, in this kind of work with continuous noise and impulse noise and kurtosis. Uh, through some conferences and things that we've done. And we'll get to talking later in, the, in this presentation about uh, damage risk criteria for impulse noises. And we'll move to that. Let's move to the next slide now. In impulse noise, this is a, a characteristic of a gunshot. And there's two features that show up here. One is the sound of the bullet as it passes by the microphone. That's the first portion there what's called an N wave or a ballistic shock wave. And then the blast, the expansion of the gases that are combusted that push the bullet out of the, out of the barrel and out the muzzle, that's the second portion of this that we see. And what is of interest is the fact that these two noises can be of similar level. If you were downrange uh, from somebody shooting, you know, maybe you're in a, a situation where you're providing cover fire for somebody or a police officer or some such, uh, it's possible for that end wave to be uh, much louder than the muzzle blast if you're far enough away from the muzzle. The muzzle is going to fall off as one over the distance and you know six decibels per doubling of distance. But the end wave falls off differently because it's produced by the, by the bullet as it moves. Let's move to the next slide. You can see here uh, what I'm talking about with different elements of gunshot noise. The first one is, of course, the primer noise that sets off the explosion in the chamber of the, of the gun. When the gas starts to expand out, you see that big sphere uh, that's showing up there, and that's the turbulent noise, the explosion that's taking place. And then the little triangular arrow that you see uh, to the right of the sphere, uh, that is the end wave, the ballistic shock wave that's produced by the bullet. And that only happens when the bullet's faster than the speed of sound. On the right side of the graph, you see a number of images of waveforms that were recorded from around a, a rifle. I don't remember the caliper. I think it was a 308 caliber, if I'm correct. But in particular, if you look at the upper part, the upper three images there, 165.9, 65.9, and 66.6, .6, right in front of the muzzle blast, you can see that end wave that I showed you in the previous slide. 
And as you move away from uh, the path of the bullet or the trajectory of the bullet, the N wave and the ballistic shock or the ballistic shock wave and the muzzle blast uh, get closer and closer together. And then when we get to the 167.5 uh, angle or 45 degrees in this case, that's when the two of them coalesce. And that's right around the joining in that image where the triangle and the sphere are meeting. And then as you move around to the back, we have uh, a falling off of the noise level uh, around the gun. Next slide. <clears throat> These are different uh, images, sort of the same image that we saw on the previous slide, but now when we're looking at uh, a person shooting a pistol, in this case, it's a revolver. And people will tell you that you, you learn very quickly how, to, how not to hold a revolver. And I can testify to that. Uh, this person has his hand underneath the, the butt of the handle. And I had my hand up closer, uh, the first time I fired one, up closer to the, the separation between the barrel and the, the uh, chamber. And the gases that you see leaking out right in between that gap, they, they got my hand. It's like, oh, that hurts. Uh, but more importantly, we can see with this wave, the bullet is just barely supersonic. It's just peeking out of that muzzle. And there's essentially two spheres in this image from the revolver. There's the one where the gas escapes between the barrel and the, and the revolution, the revolver portion. And then there's the gas that's coming out of the end of the barrel. Next slide. This is a much more complicated image. This is a blast of a, a bit of an explosion that's taking place above ground. And there's some really interesting features that are showing up here. In particular, if you look towards the edge of and at the bottom of these uh, images, these are what are called Schlieren images. Uh, they used the differential density of air as in the matter of how they film it in order to capture these images. And Gary Settles was a professor at Penn State University and has provided us with many of these images. But you can see where the ground reflection is coalescing or just about to coalesce with the actual spherical expansion uh, right there above the O. That's, that's one part. And then there are other parts. Depending on the strength of the explosion that you're dealing with, you can have a much stronger coalescence of that reflected wave with the direct shock wave. And that produces a, an effect called a mock stem. And that's really important when you're dealing with a damage risk potential for explosions, um, different kinds of weapons. It's also used to make weapons more effective. Um, that's not what we're talking about today. But I wanted to make you aware of these different elements and different types of, of images. Next slide, please. Here's an idealized waveform. So what we're seeing is a very sharp rise or a discontinuous increase in pressure right at the beginning of, of that waveform. That high pressure leads to localized heating of the air, which then creates a little bit higher pressure. And it causes the wave fronts to begin to coalesce and produce the shock wave effect that we see here. The, in, in a real waveform, that distance in time is less than about uh, five, milli five microseconds. And the A duration, or the period that it takes from that first uh, very high increase to where it comes back to zero, that's the A duration that, we're, that can be characterized in terms of what size wave, what size explosion you're dealing with. Next slide. This is uh, some work that Greg had collected back in, I don't know, 2007, 2008. And this is a firecracker. When I was a kid, I used to, right after the 4th of July, I'd be riding my bike up to the pool and on the street, you could find firecrackers that didn't get exploded. So I'd, I'd bring them home and pull out the fuse and light them off. And my parents wouldn't let me buy firecrackers, but that's how I got my, my firecrackers in. These can produce some pretty hefty duty uh, waves in terms of the energy at the ear, you know, 160, 170 decibels, depending on how far you are from it. Uh, other firecrackers are 
smaller, of course, they can produce smaller uh, impulses. And then the larger ones, we go up to things like dynamite, which you know we don't play with. Uh, you can get very high levels. Next slide. This is uh, now an impact where we have something, in this case, it's a, a one pound hammer striking a piece of wood. And it has a period of time that the wood is ringing, that the, the hammer may be ringing, depending on what you've, you've hit. Uh, and it takes, in this case, 20 to 30 milliseconds is about, uh, in this case, about 20 milliseconds for it to decay from that peak level at a, uh, well, I guess the peak level is minus 110 or 105 in this case. And then when you look at the uh, minus 10.5, that's the, the point where we're talking about something called the B duration. In the noise manual that we'll throw up a, an image of towards the end of the talk, there's a chapter in there that Greg and I have, have authored on uh, brief high level sounds. We go into some more detail in this. So I think it's important. There's potential for people to have a lot of exposure. I mean, think of carpenters. Uh, Greg and I work for a company called Stevenson and Stevenson Research and Consulting. Mark Stevenson and Carol Stevenson were persons that I worked with at NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And they had a research program with underserved workers, particularly in construction. And you know, these construction workers can have hundreds if not thousands of exposures in a daily uh, job in terms of using things like framing nailers or uh, chipping hammers or something of that sort. It's very easy to get a very high number of exposures and that puts you at, at greater risk of hearing loss. Next slide. This is an example of some uh, data that Don and Greg and I collected with uh, Dr. Mike Stewart from formerly with uh, Central Michigan University. We're all wearing a, a shirt which says uh, the Rudyard, Rudyard Gang Impulse Research Team. Uh, and we have gone to Northern Michigan where Mike Stewart has a hunting camp where we can do research with firearms and make noise with firearms and nobody gets to, uh, put off by the fact that people are blowing off guns. But we were interested in looking at the risk of an open field exposure versus uh, shooting a, a weapon from within a hunting blind. And you can see here the difference between those two waveforms. The open field is the blue uh, line that you see there. And it's basically over in the matter of a, a millisecond or so. But it takes, or I'm sorry, five or 10 milliseconds. And it can take almost um, you know, a tenth of a millisecond, a hundred or so milliseconds, or even longer for it to decay when we're inside of a hunting blind. The longer duration for those working inside or shooting inside of an enclosure, whether that be a firing range, indoor firing range, uh, it produces a lot more noise and a lot more energy that the ear is going to be potentially absorbing. Next slide. In NIOSH, we have, or in industrial hygiene, you have the hierarchy of controls. You know, the most effective approach is to physically remove the hazard. You want to eliminate that hazard. And if we can't eliminate it, then maybe we want to find something to substitute for it. So let's take, for instance, lead exposure. You know, one way that you can mitigate the lead exposure on firing ranges is to replace the ammunition with something that's not lead. There's, a, I think, a bismuth compound that you can use, frangible ammunition that can be used. <clears throat> that reduces the risk of people being exposed to lead or lead dust, lead vapors. There are other things in terms of uh, uh, carbon monoxide that's produced when firearms are, are set off. And the carbon monoxide, well, it's hard to substitute for that, but what you can do is engineer ways of getting that, that toxic uh, carbon monoxide gas out of the breathing zone where the people are shooting. And that comes into doing uh, ventilation treatments to your firing range and to make sure that the air is flowing downrange and not recirculating in the area where the workers are or the shooters are. Uh, administrative controls. Well, we want to change the way that people work. And 
one of the easiest things to do is just to say, all right, you can only do this job for so many hours. But it's less effective because all that person has to say is, well, you know, boss, I don't want to spend my time working another job today. Just let me work here for another couple hours. And if they do that enough, then you can end up with overexposures. And then perhaps the least effective is personal protective equipment. And why I say least effective is it doesn't take uh, one much. Pull out an earplug here. It doesn't take much for someone to take that earplug out of their ear and say, oh, what, what was going on there? I didn't hear you. You know, I, I need to, I, I can't hear you well enough. Maybe, maybe I need to use a different earplug. And okay, so you use that earplug and you use it wrong. The point is, is that it's up to the worker to make sure that the administrative controls and the PPE is, is being used correctly. It's uh, much better if we can do something to eliminate the noise, physically remove it, substitute it, or provide an engineering control. Next slide. So in engineering noise control, we talk about passive controls. We want to choose and identify the quietest or lowest machine vibration machines available. There are a lot of very simple things. A colleague of ours, uh, Dennis Driscoll uh, from Associates and Acoustics, I believe is what his company was. He puts on these uh, webinars or seminars for people. And really, a lot of noise control can be done by just doing the simple things. Make sure your machine is maintained. If it's vibrating a lot, Maybe there's a reason that you haven't tightened something down or, or maybe one of the workers decided, oh, it's too hard to get in and, and do maintenance on the machine. So I'm just gonna take this panel off. And the panel was there to provide uh, a noise control. You can reduce the force amplitudes. Maybe instead of uh, banging something together, you can do it through a, a hydraulic press. Uh, work that we were doing at NIOSH with General Motors, uh, they were designing into their purchase agreements, uh, noise requirements and such, so that it would make it uh, a quieter environment for their, their workers in the stamping and pressing plant to work. If you have things that are moving, well, you want to make sure that the parts are, are balanced. You have dynamic absorbers. There's ways of changing the frequencies of, of machine elements in terms of when they would vibrate and when they uh, will generate greater amounts of noise change the damping, isolate the machine panels, increase or reduce the radiation, uh, the surface area of things that are radiating, and then stagger the times of machine operations. Next slide. The path. All right, so you know, first we have the source. What do we do to control the source? The next thing is, how does that energy get to us? You know, One of the easy things that you can deal with, if you've ever lived in an apartment, well, the path is that that knock of your neighbor's stereo that's banging away across the, you know, across the wall from you if you live in an apartment building of some sort. You can put things in that are resilient mounts, rubber uh, springs, pneumatic shocks and such that will reduce the vibration and reduce the transmission between different locations. There are barriers that can be used. I have a, an example or two coming up. Uh, of how you can use barriers. You can put enclosures in, you can use absorptive materials in, for instance, firing ranges. Different kinds of mufflers. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, vibration breaks in ducts. When, when we have things that connect uh, one part of a, a heating and ventilation system to another part of the house uh, or part of the building, those duct work, if there's some noise that happens, and in, in my own house, my furnace room is right below me where I'm speaking right now. And if the, uh, if the furnace filter needs to be changed, I can tell because one of the ducts, uh, it makes the compression and expansion because of the, the extra pressure that it has. You can line the duct work, you can use flexible duct work and use damping materials. Next slide. And then the last part of this, so it's source path, source, path, and receiver. It's, well, who's the receiver? It's our ears. It's us. And this is the thing that I've spent, you know, 30 years working on. Last week, I gave a, a presentation to some of you uh, about hearing protection and hearing protector fit testing. 
There are a variety of earplugs. These are some that Don and Greg and I used in a study back in 2010 and 2011. Uh, there are different types of passive earplugs. Those would be the number four that you see there, the EAR Pod Express. There are canal caps that I don't show here. Uh, those are ones that are on a band and they, they fit in your ear. There are different types of earmuffs, whether they're passive or active in this case. That what you see there, it has amplification, but when the sound gets too loud, it turns off that amplification. There are level limiting and talk through devices. Uh, there are different types of passive ear plugs, such as the combat arms ones that you see up there at the top that are use a filter that rely on the physics of how sound flows through or how air or fluid flows through a, a small orifice. And as the pressure across that orifice becomes much larger, it changes, <clears throat> it changes the attenuation or the uh, impedance of that orifice, and it ends up producing, it, uh, producing a much greater amount of attenuation. Next slide. Receiver, if you're uh, dealing with vibrations, uh, when I mow my lawn, I always wear gloves. Why? Because if I don't, my hands get a little bit sensitive, not so much on my current lawnmower, but on my previous lawnmower, uh, they become sensitive to holding on and gripping that, that handle. So I wear a pair of gloves every time that I'm, I'm mowing. Rubber mats, you know, if you're working in a, a restaurant or something like that, uh, people have mats in front of their workspaces in, in factories and such. Anti-vibration seats, you know, now I don't have much in the way of vibration in, in my home where I'm working now, uh, but you, if you work in some kind of a vehicle or some such, having that anti-vibration will, will help you uh, endure the amount of exposure that you might have. Next slide. So this is an example from a health hazard evaluation that we conducted at NIOSH, uh, particularly Scott Bruick, who's an industrial hygienist. And what you see here is a, a pipe factory where they were making galvanized conduit and there's a steam cannon that is blowing air through the conduit to get rid of whatever may be left over from the galvanizing process. And it just made a horrendous level of noise in the order of 140 or 150 where the operator was located. So what was the solution for this? You could have come up with a way of putting an enclosure around this. Uh, I think on the next slide. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> what they did was they built an enclosure based on the recommendations from our health hazard evaluation where the operators could work inside. Now, one of the things that I've developed at NIOSH, I'll show you a picture of this in just a little bit, is an acoustic shock tube. And colleagues of mine have uh, worked with the manufacturer who developed that shock tube for us, or who built it for us, where they now have a remote control. They can go in and load it and walk out of the room and then be ready to, to shoot it remotely. Uh, it locates the personnel away from the source. It isolates that that person or the operator. The other thing that they could do in, in this particular case for the steam cannon is to rotate people through uh, that particular job location. Next slide. In that same factory, they had these uh, pieces of conduit that were rolling down and striking metal on metal. And if you've ever dropped a piece of pipe or a piece of sheet steel, that's a lot of noise. It creates a lot, a lot of noise. So one thing that they could do was to lower or, or make the, the drop be less so it doesn't generate quite so much uh, energy when it falls. But then also they put a plastic coating on the pieces that it was going to contact. So it's not going to make the, the pipe ring and resonate quite so much. Next slide. When we talk about firearms, there are different sized weapons. Uh, you know, you have everything from a, a 22 caliber firearm up to a 50 caliber, or as one of my colleagues at Brigham Young University has done measurements of, uh, these are the A-10 Warthog, the, the big guns that those things have that are just massive. Uh, 
enough energy to pick up your microphone stand and throw it down range, which it did, in fact. Uh, but this shows you what you see in terms of changing this A duration. It changes the spectrum from something that's predominantly low frequency for, say, like a howitzer of sorts, to something that's more high frequency for a, a typical small firearm. Next, let's click one more. These are a series of spectra that Randy Tubbs and I collected back in 2002 and published in an article in 2007. And these are different types of guns. We have a Colt 19, 1991, that's a 45 caliber, a Glock uh, 22, I believe that was a nine millimeter. We have 40 caliber uh, shotgun, 12 gauge, AR-15, a 223. Uh, Smith and Wesson 357, I believe, is the caliper, and the Heckler and Koch, which is a, another, uh, I think it's a 22 caliber, if I remember correctly. But there are different types of guns. But what I want you to note is the similarity of the spectra. The black line there, or the black bar in these, is the center, uh, more or less the center of the energy that we see. So they all have pretty much the same sort of energy. And it's because they're small calipers. Uh, next slide. One of the things that you can do is you can design, depending on what it is that you're working with, what, what your noise source is, you can design a way of tuning an absorber to reduce that noise. If you have, a, as you see in the frequency uh, spectra there, it has a characteristic hump to it. And you can design a cavity or a panel that is tuned specifically to that. Now, at the time that I wrote this, uh, or Chuck Cardis and I wrote the article for this, some of the work that they're doing with microperforated um, panels, it's, it's still a relatively new effort and you can layer different perforated panels on top of one another and make a, a very customized uh, tuning to the, the kind of absorption that's gonna happen by using these microperforated panels. There's a whole field of research that I don't work in, uh, but it's something I'm, I'm very much aware of. Next one. This is an area that I've been involved with. In 2009, NIOSH was asked to come up and do some noise measurement at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, Combat Arms Training Facility, the CADIF. And it is a firing range that was 21 lanes wide and 120 foot long, so like 91 by 120. And it was concrete walls, concrete floor. They had the, the ceiling tiles like what you see in a, a classroom. Those were the sorts of, of tiles that they had glued to the armor plating that was on the ceiling above where the shooters were. And that just made for a horrendous amount of reverberation. And this graph that you see there, without noise treatment, that's the dashed line on the top. These noise, uh, a firearm impulse would ring for 10 seconds or five seconds in terms of what we were, we were listening to. What we did is we, the Wright-Patterson, the Air Force had contracted with a company to install a noise treatment that consists of rock wool and a cementitious fiberboard. And those were then installed in the room. And it makes a huge difference in terms of how one uh, comes out of there. If you can imagine 21 persons shooting you know, M16s or firing a shotguns or pistols, that, that's what they typically used in this facility. Um, you know, If you're the instructor and you have to listen to that uh, several hours a day, it just is, is very wearing on you to have that amount of, of noise. Next slide, please. When we look at vibration isolation mounts, this is essentially what you see here in the schematic, uh, and then some of the different things that are different tools that use, or types of isolations that you can see. It's got a spring, the shaft can move up and down, you mount the equipment on that, and that way you can get uh, isolation from whatever vibration it might provide. Next slide. So here's a schematic uh, for the engineers out there. This is how it might work. Uh, 
uh, you've got a you've got a machine with some mass. You may have some kind of a tuned absorber. You could put it on top of a concrete mass, so it's not going to move that concrete quite so much, and it separates it in some respect from the foundation. So it's not going to travel from the machine into the foundation by having a rigid connection between the two. Next slide. Here's an example of somebody who's installed it in a building and we have uh, the absorber portion right there and then it's connected to uh, the underside of the, the portion of the building. Next slide. So passive noise controls. How do we, how do we find sources of machines that are gonna do this? Um, I'm not sure that slide's supposed to be there. Next slide. I think I've talked about that one already. Uh oh. <laughs> Let's keep going. Are you going the wrong way, Don? No, keep going. Ah. Guess we didn't delete that. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That's what I was looking for. Back up, back up, back up. There we go. So this is a, an animated GIF, but you can see there, there have some isolation uh, for the piece on the right there and a lot more vibration that's taking place uh, for the building that's set up on the left. And if you were to let this thing go uh, or have the, the movie of this, there's, there's some really interesting little movies that I've seen of these kinds of things. And that building on the left is the one that ends up falling down. And they've designed that now into buildings in the earthquake zones, uh, trying to mitigate you know, the potential for uh, damage to the buildings. Next slide. How, do you, how can you set this up? Well, you're gonna have some kind of a base. You've gotta have a, a, an isolation mat, maybe a vapor barrier. I'm kind of going backwards on this, uh, but subflooring base, isolation layer, more floor covering, and then you've got a foundation. This is just a whole process that can be built into it. And in some respects, it's not, Don and Greg and I aren't gonna be able to give you uh, all, the, all the great details of this, but this is where you, you bring in an engineer, a noise control engineer, and the National Council for Acoustic Consultants, that's a good place to start, NCAC. Uh, the Acoustical Society of America has a number of consultants. The American Industrial Hygiene Association uh, has perhaps some consultants that would be good for this. Next slide. Different types of damping. So there are unconstrained and constrained layer damping. In this case, we're looking at what is unconstrained da damping. Uh, there's a layer of material that's being applied to this piece of metal, and the energy that is contained in the vibration, it's being converted into heat by extension and compression of that viscoelastic layer. You can make this stuff kind of lightweight. It can be heavyweight. Uh, typically, it's pretty easy to apply, uh, and it's going to be, though, a little bit less effective than constrained layer damping. Let's see what the next slide is. So I, I mentioned uh, a thing that we had built at NIOSH. This is a, an acoustic shock tube. You're looking down the, the throat of the horn and you can see that it's made out of sheet metal. And when we first used this, um, the sheet metal vibrated a heck of a lot with each one of the impulses that we were creating. We were trying to generate noises in the 170 decibel range. Um, it is a stiff layer. We wanted to apply this and depending on what material you use, next slide, uh, sometimes it will stay on and sometimes it won't. Our first efforts at this, we used a material that wasn't quite so effective at staying on. And after a number of shots, it began to, to break. Uh, this material that's, that's blue that's on there, it did a, did a great job. It still does a great job. We actually ended up using a, a thicker uh, piece of metal for building our horn, but you can see now the shape of, of the horn. And on the left side of that is where the shock tube is. Next slide. Constrained layer damping is a different beast. What you're doing here is putting a damping material in between two layers of metal. And instead of trying to get the extension uh, 
and compression of that as the metal flexes, you're now dealing with it by, by dealing with the shear effect. And as you shear that material, it's going to be much more effective uh, in terms of how it dissipates noise or dissipates vibrations. Next slide. You can, if you're doing building or construction, you can make these things yourself. There are things such as green glue or RTV silicon, mastic adhesive, pitch-based damping. You can apply those in between things, whether it be sheet metal or fiberglass board or hard fiber board, plywood, uh, you know, your, your uh, sheet rock or something like that. That's where these can be applied in, in some construction situations, and it'd be very useful and effective in reducing noise uh, transmission from one part of a building to the next. Next slide. This is uh, some research that we were conducting with jackhammers, trying to understand uh, the noise produced by chipping hammers and jackhammers. Jackhammers have noise levels on the other of at least 115 decibels. Uh, going back to the kurtosis, um, the kurtosis additional risk that we were finding in, in just some of the, the jackhammer work that I looked at, um, it's about six decibels additional risk. So, you know, instead of 115, it could be equivalent to 120. Uh, in this particular case, Ed Zeckman was looking at applying a, a piece of uh, silicon material around the um, jackhammer and strapping it in place and trying to reduce the ringing. It was actually very effective. Uh, we looked at applying some constrained layer damping in uh, channels that were milled into the, into the uh, jackhammer. But unfortunately, as you started to use it, the, the material that we used to glue it in place uh, didn't survive. So it wasn't, it wasn't the best, uh, best solution. But anyways, this is, this is an example of one way in which you can, you can see this. And if you, if you drive by, the, this morning I drove over from Indiana to Cincinnati where I used to work and went by some jackhammering that was taking place. And it's like, yeah, it's still noisy. There are ways that they could reduce that noise. Next slide, please. Um, expandable foam core. So this is getting at the question of having leaks in the acoustics in, put it up here, the noise manual. There's a section in there on how to do noise treatment and engineering control. You know, just a small leak is going to allow a fair amount of sound to come through. The bigger the leak, the more sound that comes through. And pretty soon you may as well not even have the wall because you got, at least if you're looking at noise, uh, it's just a, a lot of energy that's getting through the, the leaks. You have different types of, of approaches to doing it, uh, weatherproofing, insulating, soundproofing, filling the gaps, filling the holes, uh, be aware of, of chemicals that off gas from this. Uh, try not to get the formaldehyde. It's, uh, if anybody remembers Hurricane Katrina and Rita, uh, the e was it the FEMA that provided the trailers, there was an issue with formaldehyde that was off-gassing in the, in the trailers for the people that were displaced from their homes. So uh, that's an issue. Next slide. Ah, here we go. Firearm suppressors. And this is an area that Greg and Donna and myself are actively involved in, trying to do measurements and trying to understand and characterize the performance of firearm suppressors. What it does is it breaks up that initial muzzle blast. It doesn't do anything to suppress or reduce the noise of the ballistic shock wave produced by the bullet flying through the air, but it does mitigate a lot of the, the high amplitude of the shock wave that comes out of the end of the muzzle. And that's because all of those chambers that you see there in the cutaway, um, that's allowing the gas to build up and have turbulence and uh, get caught up and have a chance to not all come out at, at one shot, all at one time. Next slide. These are some numbers for different weapons that we had tested. Uh, a 22 pistol, a 22 rifle uh, with super and subsonic ammunition, the blue, dark blue and light blue are the supersonic ammunition, the green and sort of 
uh, ochre color are subsonic ammunition. And we're looking at the differences between the sub or the suppressed and the unsuppressed conditions. And you can get quite a bit of suppression. In this particular case, if we look at the 308 rifle between the supersonic uh, over on the right-hand edge of the, the graph, thank you, Don, uh, it's about 175. But if we go back three bars, you can see that we're at about 140 decibels. Next one down when we go to the suppressed subsonic ammunition. So it can be quite effective if you don't have to use supersonic ammunition, you don't have to expose yourself to, to that uh, risk. Next slide. When I mentioned that we're trying to understand how to characterize this, it's because there are different places that one could locate your microphone to do the measurement. There are different ways that you can assess the effectiveness of the firearm. Uh, if we're looking at high and low velocity or super and subsonic, uh, the different positions, the muzzles are, or the positions at the muzzle are the purple diamonds that you see in this. The right and the left ear are where the shooter is located. And then these light blue images or light blue uh, triangles are where an instructor might be standing behind the shooter. And one of the points that I, I would make is that I think most of the manufacturers are expressing their performance of their device based upon uh, the, the peak suppression, the reduction in the peak level uh, of the rifle. But the peak level is not really the best, as we'll see in a moment from when Greg gets to it. Uh, it's not necessarily the best way to characterize the performance of a suppressor. Perhaps something like the change in the A-weighted energy is a better choice. Next slide. How do we reduce these high-level noise exposures? Well, hearing protection seems to be uh, the, the mechanism of choice for things like firearms. It reduces the noise at the ear. It's specific to the shooting activity. You have to make sure that what you're using is properly fit and the research that's been conducted by Mike Stewart and Deanna Meinke, another one of our uh, colleagues, actually Don works with Deanna at University of Northern Colorado. Uh, research shows that firearm users do not consistently use hearing protection devices, even during practice, target practice. Next slide. Here's an example from the US Navy and uh, Air Force research that they conducted jointly for persons who are aboard uh, an aircraft carrier. And they're supposed to wear double protection because the noise levels of the jets can be over 140, depending on where you're located around that jet. And so what they did is they went through and they did a series of measurements in the laboratory, that's the Air Force Labs portion of this, where they had them insert the earplug 25%, 50, 75, and 100%. And these are the median a-weighted noise reduction values that we're seeing there. So it's anywhere from two, two decibels to 34 decibels to the having it fully inserted. Next slide. Oh, I guess there was one that was missing on there. But anyways, um, we'll get back to it maybe. Uh, in the effectiveness of hearing protection, it's like, how is it fit? If I'm looking at this particular soldier here, I can see most of that earplug hanging out of his ear. He is maybe getting 20%, 25% insertion depth. Uh, next one. Of course, you got the cool guy who's got his Oakley sunglasses and his boonie hat on. And guess what? He's got a big old leak around where that earmuff is sitting and is located. Now, I tell people that my own personal experience with firing a firearm I mean, yes, I wear glasses. They're this nice uh, skinny rim. I've used those when I was out doing some hunting. I had some safety glasses that have a not quite as skinny a rim as a, or a temple piece as I have here. But I fired a shotgun. I had my earmuffs on and the earmuff shifted and I took a second shot and I ended up with a temporary threshold shift as a result of not recognizing that there was this big gap that was produced. Uh, even worse, the first time I went out hunting, I didn't even have protection on. 
So what do you think happens there? Well, I didn't have a temporary threshold shift, but I certainly came away with my ears just bing. They were ringing something fierce. Next slide, please. These are one of the studies that we did at Fort Collins with, you can see a mannequin in the middle, right above the, the shooter's left hand. There's the mannequin head, and it's got some earmuffs on it. But more importantly, if we click it once, you can see there's a, we're investigating a particular earplug. And because they're indoors, NIOSH has made, as, as, a, as a result of the research that we've done, we issued a, a, an alert, a NIOSH alert document on mitigating lead exposure and noise in indoor firing ranges. And one of the recommendations is that you have people wear double protection. Uh, particularly, it'd be nice to have some kind of an electronic earmuff so it amplifies sound when you need to hear somebody talking to you, but then also have a moderate uh, hearing protector earplug in place uh, under that muff. And that way you're, you're being protected all the time, but you also have that double protection. In this particular case, there's no way with that helmet that he'd be able to fit another earmuff underneath it. Next slide. And in this case, we're looking at a, a firing range. And again, you know, look at that first person's ear. You can see easily 50% of that earplug and maybe sort of on the same person, uh, or the second person over. So it's about how well you do in terms of putting those earplugs in place. Next slide. Ah, this is the one I was looking for. They did a survey of some 202 ears persons who were working aboard the aircraft carrier on the flight deck. And if you look at that, 47% were not wearing earplugs underneath their earmuffs, and they were supposed to. 7% of those persons had an inadequate insertion. So they're just not getting very much of, of attenuation due to the earplug, and they're getting a limited amount of attenuation due to the earmuff. So it's, it's really about training. It's about making and setting an example for your workers when you're exposed to noise to protect yourself each and every time you're exposed. Next slide. Last week, I gave a webinar with Lori Wells from 3M Company, and she and I went over hearing protector fit testing. And unfortunately, we couldn't record the, the presentation, but if you are interested, you can contact Jessica and she should be able to provide you with the, the slides that we presented there. But hearing protector fit testing is technology that's available now and you can use this to tell whether or not you're doing a good job inserting uh, the protectors. It gives you a quantitative estimate of the attenuation of the protector and it's a tool that gives you a better fit, helps you achieve a better fit. Next slide. Why do we care about this? Well, when you get a piece of hearing protector equipment, it has, as required by the Environmental Protection Agency, a noise reduction rating. And Lee Hager with, uh, I think it was before he was working with, with 3M, but Lee Hager, one of our colleagues, coined the term, the NRR means not really relevant. Why is it not really relevant? Because in the real world, and this is from research that Elliot Berger and John Franks and John Casale and others have uh, put together, in the real world, you see where these red bars are. That gives you a sense of what the median value is. And the range, the standard deviation, are the width of those arrows. And that's just one standard deviation. It's just it, it doesn't tell you, you know, what, what a person achieves is not going to be very well predicted by the noise reduction rating. Now, that's only part of the story. In work that myself and Dr. Stevenson, Mark Stevenson, and Jeremy Fetterman and, and others in different uh, fields or in, in different research areas, we found that doing instruction, giving that personal one-on-one -on -one instruction dramatically improves the attenuation that workers can achieve. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, you're, you're gonna go and train them once and they're gonna do a great job every time following that, 
but it does mean that they're going to improve their attenuation significantly. And when you come back six months later from research that our Chinese colleagues have done, they're still uh, having a significantly better performance. Next slide. Here's an example of 192 users. You know, which user are you? Are you the one down there by zero or are you the one up there by uh, 35? It's hard to say. I know where I fall. I try to do a very good job inserting my earplugs every time. And it depends. Some earplugs are harder to fit than others. Other earplugs are just plain not comfortable for people. So it's important that you take the time with the worker to make sure that it fits, make sure that they can wear it and they can do a good job. Next slide. So why do we fit test? We wanna figure out who's at risk for noise-induced hearing loss. We wanna figure out whether that hearing protection device is appropriate for their needs. You can use fit testing to train the people who are supposed to train the workers. You know, if the trainer doesn't know how to do it, you can darn well bet that the, <laughs> the worker's not gonna know how to do it. You can motivate workers to consistently use protection in noisy environments. You know, I, I mentioned my instance where I, I had the earmuff shift and in 1995 when I took up hunting, the very first time I went out and shot the shotgun, I didn't have any protection on. Hmm, what's that say about me as a scientist? Well. I learned my lesson. The next time I went out, I brought my hearing protection. I had it on, I had it off. I had it on, I had it off. The quarry came by, I fired my shotgun. I got down out of the tree stand. It's like, that was really dumb. What I do now, I do not fire any kind of a weapon without wearing hearing protection, without wearing the safety glasses that one needs to wear. You can train workers to properly fit and use hearing protection. You can increase the self-efficacy in other words, if I know how to fit something properly, I can be able to look at my coworkers or whatever and say, hey, you know, we need to do something to help improve how you're wearing that hearing protection device. Fit testing gives us a mechanism for estimating noise exposure better because it's a quantitative estimate for the individual and not some population statistic like the NRR uh, 84 that you saw on the, the bar chart a couple slides back, you know, which one are you in that, in that NRR 84? That's where we want to do is if we find that you're not doing it right or your worker's not doing it right, take the time to train them so that they're going to be able to hear their kids, their grandkids, uh, be able to enjoy nature. You know, myself, at what age that I am now, I live with tinnitus every day. I have it all the time. 24-7. It can reduce the liability for noise-induced hearing loss and workers' compensation costs. There's a paper that will be coming out hopefully in November that will look at information on workers' compensation in seminars and hearing that it's authored by one of my colleagues. It can reduce costs. It's been shown to reduce costs by maintaining a smaller inventory of protection. Next slide. All ears are not the same. You know, my ear is the one on the right side, in the middle, and on the left side. One of my colleagues is the one wearing the green earplug, and I can tell you that he does get a good attenuation with that, but that's all the further that earplug goes into his ear. He doesn't have big ears. And the, the one that you see there with the yellow or orange and teal, that was someone at the Air Force Laboratory or at the CADM where we did some the noise measurements, and you know, I, I wasn't in a position where I could go through and instruct each of those uh, military personnel, but I can tell you that he's not getting enough protection for if he were firing a, an M16, which in fact they were. Visual inspection may not be able to identify a good fit. Qualitative checks, well, that's all they are. They're qualitative. High exposures, such as what we're dealing with the firing range, it requires high attenuation. Next slide. Here's some things with level limiting muffs. The question I was asking here was, gee, does it make a difference whether the device is turned off or if I've got it at unity gain or if I've got it at maximum gain? And the answer to that was, no, not really. And there's some small differences, but they're not significant. They're not statistically significant. Next slide. 
this is uh, more work that we've done with our, our Rudyard group, uh, looking at measurements for um, a firearm and testing them in an outdoor setting. And we did different distances from the, uh, from the source. So we we're a, a meter to the, to the right of the muzzle. We were about three or four meters behind the muzzle, and then about maybe 10 or 12 meters back behind the muzzle. And you can see that there's some change in attenuation as a function of the level, the proximity of it. And part of that comes from the fact that depending on the device, such as the, the um, combat arms open ear, because it's a filter, the filter has a variable performance depending on how loud the sound is and how great the pressure differential is across that filter. It makes a difference. Uh, the EB-1, when it was turned on uh, there, you see that the 130 dB performance was really low. Well, this was an early version of the product that was uh, we were testing. And it turned out that it cut off the, the noise of the gun, but what it didn't cut out was the echo from the surrounding woods. And so when the echo came back, it actually amplified the echo and making it loud enough to reduce this apparent uh, impulse peak insertion loss that we were seeing. Next slide. Here are just some different things with uh, different ways of testing it. We have shock tube, those are the dash lines. We have uh, firearm noise. These are some measurements that I conducted with uh, Cameron Fackler and uh, Elliot Berger from 3M Company. Uh, just comparing the performance of these. Next slide. We're also comparing some of the nonlinear devices with the noise measurement that is fundamental to the, uh, the noise reduction rating, or it's listening to it in continuous noise. So this particular device, it's one of these nonlinear passive filters and it gives more attenuation as the impulse level increases. But what you can see is in the continuous noise, uh, the black line or the really attenuation at threshold, the symbols with the lines in them, um, those two agree nicely, but they're not predictive of what happens when we get to the very high level impulses. Next slide. Same sort of image uh, as the previous one, but now we're looking at a non, uh, just a plain old passive foam earplug. And you can see that the, the NRR is actually predictive of what we're expecting to see in terms of performance. Uh, the IPL, however, for this particular earplug, the impulse peak insertion loss is significantly greater than the NRR of 29, which is essentially trying to, to describe the upper edge of those bars uh, that we see there. Next slide. All right, I think I've got to wrap up my portion here. If it doesn't fit, full protection isn't gonna happen. You gotta wear it every time you're exposed. Double protection, now we get into issues of bone conduction. Uh, simple rules, if you've got passive protectors, you know, a passive earplug like a, you know, a foam earplug or a, a pre-molded earplug, the NR is gonna give you a, a bit of a guidance as to how it would perform. If you have electronic hearing protection devices where they're listening all the time to the sound, but they turn off the sound uh, when it exceeds a certain threshold, uh, the earplug or the earmuff, earplug and earmuff are gonna pretty much yield the passive performance. In other words, if the device were turned off, that's about what you can expect for them. There are devices such as active noise reduction or active noise cancellation, and they're maybe not designed to work in impulsive noise correctly because it takes time for the circuitry to figure out what is the noise to generate a canceling waveform uh, to make them to effectively cancel the sound in the ear canal. Passive level dependent protectors, they're going to change the protection you see as the level goes up you'll get more protection as the level goes up. It's not always the thing that you want to use. If you've got some really high hefty duty levels or if you're you know, doing a lot of exposures, you need to consider whether you should wear double protection or not. 
Next slide. There is a, a program that Deanna Mikey and Dr. William Hal Martin had developed and Susan Grice out of the Oregon Health Sciences University and, and University of Northern Colorado. And it's called the Dangerous Decibels Program. And Don is involved with that. Uh, there are three strategies that they have, which is walk away. If it's loud, walk away. If it's loud, turn it down. If it's loud, protect your hearing. My wife and I and some friends went to a concert a couple of years back, and I, haven't, I don't go to too many concerts. I go to things like symphony or opera or something of that sort. That's more my taste. Um, but I tell you what, we went to this conference con concert and it was just horrendous. I went out to the <laughs> to the vendors and found that they were selling earplugs and bought, you know, four pairs of earplugs at the cost of two dollars a pair, which is absurd. Uh, and now I was fine. I enjoyed the rest of the concert. And the last slide that's not on the not part of or the last panel there, noise control engineering, it's trying to reduce the noise that's reaching the person. You know, that's the portion that you as an industrial hygienist can employ and use to your benefit to protect your workers. Next slide. Uh, it begins with teaching people at a young age. You know, this is some work that Deanna has done, uh, Deanna Mikey has done with uh, youth shooters, trying to inform them. Dangerous Decibels in part was aimed at, at getting uh, children, uh, youngsters, to understand the risk of hearing loss. The techniques and the tools that they've developed work over into our adults because, hey, you know, adults are just big kids. We just don't want to admit it. Uh, but it's been successfully adapted in changing knowledge and attitudes and intended behavior in youth who shoot firearms. It's also been adapted for work with police departments in Australia and New Zealand and other locations, other types of areas where they're trying to apply this information. It's a very simple message, you know, which is walk away, turn it down, protect your hearing. And in the case of AIHA type industrial hygienists, control the noise. You can do something about that. Next slide. And this is where I hand it over to Don, I believe it is. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Um, what we're going to talk about next is basically issues with how do we measure these types of sounds, impulsive types of sounds. And I want to just, um, just review a little bit about the impulse noise or impulsive noise characteristics that we talked about before. Specifically, remember we're talking about a waveform that is really high amplitude typically, really short duration, and I, I like the, the word peaky. It's got a huge peak on it, essentially, and it's, again, very, very short duration. How do we capture accurately a waveform that is very high amplitude, very short duration, peaky? It actually turns out to be more challenging than you might think. So in terms of a data acquisition system that could be used to capture, again, accurately, this type of a waveform, we need a wide dynamic range because those those signals can be very, very high in amplitude. Um, really, the high dynamic range, we have to be able to, to have a system that can capture sounds that are very, very high in level. We need a high frequency resolution. It turns out if you're talking about a waveform that is very, very short duration, um, this peaky type of waveform, what that really translates to is high frequency in terms of the changes in the actual waveform itself. And in order to capture those high frequencies um, and that very, very high rise time of that pressure waveform, we have to have a very fast responding system. This is called a, a slew rate of uh, the, the electronic components that are present in a system. We'll come back to that in a second. So where could things go wrong in terms of making measurements? Well. It turns out there's lots of different areas in which we can have some problems. So we're going to cover these um, as we go through. I'm going to talk about a number of these, these issues, and then Greg is going to follow up with a few others, uh, issues that are more specific to dosimeters and sound level meters. But we're going to cover issues about microphones for a sound level meter or data acquisition system. 
Uh, we'll talk about clipping, what clipping is, aliasing a little bit, as well as time averaging, fast and slow responses, and weighting um, that we would find for a sound level meter. So what are the components of a digital sound capture or measurement system? This is kind of a, a basic um, view of how a system captures a sound. We have a microphone. The microphone is used to capture pressure changes in the atmosphere, <clears throat> obviously, and that's connected to a preamplifier and a power supply. The preamplifier is going to take the signal from the microphone. It's going to make it big enough that we can actually do something with it. The power supply is actually there to essentially run the microphone, depending on the type of microphone element we have. That signal coming from the preamplifier is going to go to an input amplifier, which is going to produce another increase in the signal's amplitude again, so that we can actually manipulate it and, and do something with it. The signal coming from the microphone itself um, is going to be very, very small. We're going to increase its amplitude so we can capture it accurately. After we've done that, we move towards a process in which we're going to take a signal that is an analog, a real world signal, and convert it to a computerized version. And to do that, we're going to have to have a number of different events occur. One something, uh, the first uh, part of this is called an anti-aliasing filter. And that's going to lead us into the process of changing to a digital format. Um, we'll have, we'll talk about sampling rate and quantization depth in a minute. This is the process of going from an analog signal that we would get from a microphone to a digital signal that a computer can recognize as a series of ones and zeros. And in that process, once we've converted to a digital signal, we can do all sorts of things in terms of processing the waveform. We can filter it. We can uh, look at uh, time constraints. There's, we can average it. We can do lots of different things that are happening within the sound level meter or digital acquisition system. So what are the minimum components we need for this to work with impulsive type of uh, signals? First off, as I mentioned before, we need this fast rise time. The signal be, has, or the system has to be able to respond very, very quickly. The, the waveform itself, the peaky waveform, has this very, very fast rise to it, that pressure waveform. How quickly does it have to respond? Um, maybe less than 10 microseconds to the peak. Uh, it should never be more than 20 microseconds. And these waveforms are very, very fast in terms of their rise or of, of the pressure itself and therefore the system that measures them also has to be able to match that or exceed it. Slew rate, this ability to change in terms of electronic um, values, often need to exceed two volts per microsecond. This is actually a very very high slew rate for an electronic device. Not all electronic devices can change their, um, their value that quickly. The dynamic range must extend at least a decibel above the peak you're measuring, and it should be way more than that, actually, to be more accurate. The frequency response has to be a decade above the highest frequency of interest. We have to be able to have a system that is responding very, very quickly and be able to capture and resolve high frequency sounds um, and higher than the actual frequency of the waveform itself. For, to get to there, we need a sampling rate. Uh, which is abbreviated F sub S, um, somewhere around 160 kilohertz, which will give us the ability to capture a signal up to around 80,000 hertz. So let's start with the microphone aspect of things, and we're going to kind of move through this signal flow diagram and talk about some of the, the limitations of each of these components. First off, the microphone. There's, there's more than one type of microphone that might be used with the sound level meter or data acquisition system. A ceramic or piezo microphone, a condenser microphone, they are pre-polarized versus externally polarized, and people have even used, we have for a number of research studies, a blast probe, and that's a different type of transducer. It's not a microphone, but it does respond to very, very rapid and very large pressure changes. Considerations for selection of a microphone, the signal amplitude range. Uh, Blast Probe is used for very, very high amplitude signals, probably too high that you'll even be able to measure with a microphone itself. The signal frequency range, as we talked about a second ago, the, the sound field itself, where you are actually making a measurement, and does the microphone need 
polarization voltage. Some will, some won't. And if it needs that polarization voltage, that is under the purview of the preamplifier and power supply of the system. If we just take a look at some different condenser microphones, which are commonly used in sound level meters, we note that actually there's some differences here um, based on the size of the microphone and what they can actually capture. So on the top up here, we have a one inch diaphragm microphone and we're looking at the frequency response of this microphone. And we can see that, well, actually we've got a roll off here at somewhere around well, maybe about eight kilohertz. We start to really start attenuating a signal, but if we go to a quarter inch or maybe even an eighth inch microphone, that roll off happens much, much higher in terms of uh, frequency component up in the range of 100 or even 150,000 uh, hertz. That is more appropriate for the signals we need to measure for impulsive uh, measurements. So a one inch diaphragm signal, uh, while it can capture fairly high frequencies, it can't actually capture, physically can't capture uh, the highest frequencies that we would need for impulsive types of waveforms. Here's another example of some characteristics of microphones based on diaphragm size. And we have an eighth inch microphone on the left and a one inch microphone on the right. And the eighth inch microphone, the dynamic range for each of these microphones is essentially represented by the blue and the orange line. The eighth inch microphone, its overall dynamic range is about the same um, compared to a one inch microphone, but it's shifted up in that it can capture sounds that are much, much higher in amplitude than the one inch microphone can. So not only are there frequency component differences um, for the one inch versus the eighth inch or quarter inch microphone, there's also amplitude range, specifically the highest amplitude uh, characteristics are different. A one inch microphone can probably only capture sounds up to around 150 dB, uh, maybe even less than that, and a quarter inch up to maybe about 170 or so, eighth inch microphone up to around 185. So again, signals that are very high in amplitude, depending where that signal is being measured, that might be the case. We might need to use eighth inch microphones or a quarter inch. For a lot of the research we've done on gunshot noise, uh, we've relied on eighth inch microphones for many microphone placements that were close to the actual firearm itself. Well, let's take a look at some real world data as what this actually means. This is a, an impulse that was provided through an eighth inch microphone, a quarter inch a microphone, a quarter inch high sensitivity microphone, and a half inch microphone here. And we're looking at the resulting waveform itself. So if we take a look at that same, again, same impulse going through an eighth inch microphone, we actually measure its peak at 184 dB SPL. That same waveform that would be delivered through a uh, quarter inch microphone is down to 180 dB. It's underestimating the peak, therefore. And if we jump down to a half inch microphone, half inch diameter uh, diaphragm microphone, we see that the peak is now at 168 dB SPL. Also, the peak is actually occurring at a later time period. And this is related to the frequency response of those microphones themselves that I mentioned before. Eighth inch microphone can capture a higher frequency. Therefore, it's going to have more ability to actually accurately capture that rise of uh, the waveform itself. OK, so we know we've got some issues with the different types of microphones based on the diameter of the diaphragm, their physical limitations. What about orientation of the microphone? Um, normal orientation of the microphone pointed straight at the sound source versus grazing incidence is actually shown here on this graph. So here's the normal um, incidence of the microphone. We've got a wave front coming right at the microphone diaphragm and that's shown up here. And here's grazing incidence down over here. Actually what can happen is we can actually generate a pressure waveform that builds up on the diaphragm uh, as the wave from hit wavefront hits the microphone itself and that pressure gradient is actually not correct. It's actually due to the physical properties of the microphone. So that can actually occur for normal incidence of the microphone and specifically it can produce a dB increase, uh, apparent dB increase at around maybe nine decibels and this is at around 2000 hertz. 
if we would jump down to a grazing incidence here where the wavefront is actually going across the top of the microphone diaphragm, we actually don't have that problem anymore. So we're not causing this um, um, incorrect increase in the pressure waveform just due to the orientation of the microphone. So the orientation is actually quite important. We could overestimate a peak if we have normal incidence versus grazing incidence of the um, microphone just because of the wavefront going across the diaphragm for grazing or directly into it for normal incidence. All right, let's take a look at the, uh, the power supply and the preamplifier right now. That was all microphone issues and possible limitations. What about the preamplifier? Well, for the preamplifier, we have to have a device that also has a, a wide frequency response. It has to be essentially matched to the uh, microphone and should optimally be even a wider frequency response than that. So we have to have a frequency response that's quite flat uh, from 10 hertz to at least 126 kilohertz for the power supply and the, free, the preamplifier itself. Dynamic range, well, we have to be able to go up to maybe 14 volts a peak uh, from the preamplifier itself. That is way beyond what a lot of systems can actually do in terms of a sound level meter. They're, they're not meant to have that quite a wider range. The slew rate is we excuse me, mentioned before, needs to be very, very high, maybe up to 20 volts per microsecond. Again, that's very, very uncommon for um, preamplifiers we would find in a standard sound level meter. And they have to be able to supply polarization voltage to the microphone if it's a uh, non-polarized microphone. So power supply limitations for that preamplifier. Turns out the supply voltage is going to correspond to that input limit of that system itself. So a standard half inch mic that might come on a sound level meter and a nine volt power supply, there would be a theoretical maximum of that microphone and preamplifier of up to about 149 dB SPL. It just couldn't physically go higher based on those, those limitations of the power supply and the microphone itself. Many systems would, many sound level meter systems would therefore clip actually, maybe even lower than this, maybe around 143 dB due to those physical design limitations. I'll explain what clipping is in a minute, but it's bad. <laughs> we don't want it. <laughs> All right, input amplifier. This input amplifier allows you to scale the range of a sound level meter. That might be automatic or it might be a manual that's on the sound level meter itself. So there's a range control and we can increase the gain to protect the signal to noise ratio. We have enough signal versus the background noise and especially the equipment self noise for low level inputs. But we also can decrease gain so that we don't have overloading or clipping. Um, there's a slew rate issue here as well. The slew rate for that input amplifier also has to be very, very, very high, essentially matching the previous components. Well, that gets us into the process of converting a signal to a digital format. Basically, any sound level meter you would buy now is going to be a digital device, a computer. And it requires conversion of an analog real-world signal that's coming from the microphone and the preamplifier and the, the input amplifier to a digital format, a series of ones and zeros that a computer, computer can understand. This process involves two things. The analog to digital conversion process involves sampling and also quantization. I'll explain more of those in a second. Also during this process, we can do things like have filtering being applied to the signal, weighting, A weighting, C weighting, or flat as well, as well as averaging time constants that might be applied. And this is gonna be done after we've, we've gone through the digital conversion component of the uh, sound level meter. This is how a signal gets converted to a digital format. We're, we're looking at here in this graphic is a signal that is an analog signal. I just realized that this, this spotlight is red and my graphic is red, sorry. But the left hand of the screen, we see a sine wave that's present there and we can see it's a continuous waveform going up and down and it's, it's continuous. It's, it's not uh, jumping from one spot to another. We just see this continuous movement essentially of the waveform up and down. What we have when we go to a digital format is we have to change that continuous waveform to a stepwise one. A computer is physically limited 
to uh, a certain number of measurements it can take and hold. And that is in terms of time, which are called these sample numbers, but also in terms of amplitude, which are called these quantization steps. So digital to analog conversion means we're taking a continuous format signal and we're chunking it into little time periods, these samples, that's the process called sampling, but also amplitude characteristics, amplitude chunks. That's called quantization steps. This is actually three bit quantization, two to the third power, which gives us eight steps, which is not a lot of steps. We, th we can see these jerky um, steps going up here, and which doesn't really look very much like our original waveform. It's, it doesn't have steps in it. But if we increase the number of quantization steps and we increase the number of samples taken per second, we can more and more approximate our original signal and get very, very close to it. So that's the process of analog to digital conversion and sampling and quantization are critical components for actually acquiring and having an accurate waveform that's being captured. During this process also, what uh, commonly happens is we use something called an anti-aliasing filter. An anti-aliasing filter is present to essentially make that, that sampling and quantization process more accurate. There's something called aliasing that can occur, which is the creation of a new waveform where we didn't want one in the first place. And that can happen during this conversion process. So digital signal acquisition processes typically have anti-aliasing filters applied to them. The sampling rate, as I mentioned, needs to be very, very, very high or very, very fast. And the quantization bit depth, we need lots of quantization bits to be accurate. How much in terms of sampling rate? I'm going to go over this quickly, but how much do we need in terms of sampling rate? We have to have a sampling rate that's at least twice as high as our highest frequency of interest. This is from the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. If we have too low of a sampling rate, we will actually undershoot our measurements. We'll, we'll measure a signal and we can miss the peak. It won't be able to capture the high frequency peak components. So we have to have very, very high sampling rates, not only to capture the peak, but also to avoid aliasing. Quantization levels. If we have a low quantization bit depth, very, very few of those amplitude steps, the amplitude measurements won't be accurate. And again, we can actually make a measurement that is not accurate and we can undershoot in terms of the actual measurement. We might have a, a signal that's 180 decibels. It might turn out our measurement might show uh, 172 decibels. We can also have a problem with clipping. Uh, clipping uh, is something I'll mention a little bit more in a second, but that's a real problem that can occur with these electronic devices that can essentially destroy your signal without you knowing it and also cause inaccurate measurements. All right, we mentioned anti-aliasing filters, and there are other filters that might be applied as well with uh, a digital acquisition system. And what we're looking here are two different types of filters, an elliptic filter and a Butterworth filter on the right. And we're looking at an unfiltered signal in the blue and then different variations of three uh, filters um, for Butterworth and for the elliptic filter um, that are present on each of these. And we can actually see that for each of these filters, when you apply a filter, you're changing the waveform. And specifically, if that filter has a pretty low cutoff frequency, like 23.6 kilohertz, we've really changed the waveform, that's this orange line, in a way that is changing the, the time relationships. The peak is occurring later in time, and the peak is a lot lower than the unfiltered waveform. So we can actually have anti-aliasing filters that can actually produce some of these changes. There might be other filters that a sound level meter might have as well, they can also produce these type of filtering changes to the waveform, which can reduce, again, accuracy. I mentioned clipping a few times already. <clears throat> I want to mention this a little bit more specifically. Clipping means that the signal has exceeded the dynamic range of the microphone or the preamplifier or any a part of that process of capturing a signal. And if you exceed its dynamic range, what happens is the system saturates. It can't go higher 
and we actually literally clip off the, the peaks and the valleys of the waveform. It's like you took a scissors and, and, and cut off parts of the waveform. And what that really means is, well, if the waveform was this high, this is the peak of the waveform, we don't have it. We've not captured it. And we can actually make a measurement, a peak measurement that would be inaccurate. It would be an undershooting peak estimate. Um, so this is clipping. And again, clipping means the signal is too big for the system. This can occur from microphone choice, inaccurate microphone choice, or issues with the preamplifier or the setting of the gain range of the sound level meter can all produce clipping. Another issue what happens with clipping is besides clipping the top and the bottom of the signal off, reducing the peak of measurement, in other words, is we can actually add another signal or many signals to the system. What happens with clipping is we can actually produce frequencies that weren't there to start with. This is a sine wave that was not clipped, one kilohertz sine wave. This is a, a spectrum of the amplitude spectrum of one kilohertz sine wave. Here's our waveform. I've clipped it, and if we take a look at that spectrum, here is that one kilohertz sine wave. We've also now added in two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz. We've added in a series of harmonics above that, that they are now part of the waveform. They shouldn't be there. That can also occur with clipping, meaning our signal has now been destroyed. Um, we've added signals to it, and we've also destroyed the top and bottom peak measurements. Uh, a little bit back to filtering, when I mentioned A-weighting filtering specifically here um, in terms of what it's actually doing for us when we do actually do filtering uh, using a sound level meter. This is an A-weighting filter, and here's a C-weighting filter, and here's unfiltered in terms of a waveform, or for the spectrum re relative response of a filter. A-weighting cuts out low frequencies, essentially. C-weighting does as well, but not as much, and the unfiltered is not cutting out any frequencies, not attenuating any frequencies. If we go with linear or unfiltered, that's this blue line on the response here. This is an uh, impulse noise. The A weighting is the red line right here. We've moved from 166 dB to 161 dB just by applying A weighting to it. Again, that A weighting is actually going to reduce the peak, but also the time course is a little bit off as well. So the, when that peak occurs is later in time as we showed before. So A weighting itself is problematic in terms of measuring that actual peak of the energy itself. However, A weighting does give us an idea of how energy does get transferred into the cochlea by the middle ear transfer function. And this is an example of this. There's our A weighting curve. And this is a view of the transfer function in blue on the middle ear. And those curves match up quite well, actually. We use A weighting for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons that A weighting is used is that it actually does show us how energy is being um, brought in into the cochlea. One thought about this, however, to consider is that, well, real world data from many people uh, and looking in terms of the transfer function going through the middle ear is highly variable and this is a view of that this is the relative response here and that hay weighting curve is kind of in the middle all these blue lines those are individual data points so there sure is a lot of variability uh, from one person to the next all right a um, couple more slides here just want to mention real quickly time averaging what does time averaging do for us in terms of measuring the signal itself impulsive signal well Averaging times a fast averaging time on a meter, we would have a measurement of 137 dB versus an impulse setting on a meter of 140 dB when the actual true peak level, if we used no time weighting um, and no filtering as well, would be 166. Time averaging is averaging over a certain amount of time period. It's averaging that energy, meaning you're taking that peak you're not measuring the peak, you're averaging the energy around it. So that's always going to reduce the overall level that's showing up on a sound level meter. Even if you have an impulse setting on a sound level meter, the impulse setting on this one was 140 compared to the actual peak level that we would measured um, from a study of 166 dB. All right, so what? 
we just wanted to measure the noise, right? Why did I have to make it so complicated? Um, here's why. Take it away, Greg. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming today. The uh, please next slide uh, and one more. All right. I think one of the things that we need to understand with the tools that we typically use, they're designed for steady state noises or for continuous noises. Uh, and the extent to which they work for impulses is going to be somewhat variable. One example of that is the figure that you can see in the lower left hand side of this slide, where you have the allowable frequency deviations for a type one, uh, which is the green line, and a type two sound level meter, which is the pair of red lines. And I just want to point out to you, first of all, there are substantial uh, amounts of allowable or tolerable error uh, that increase with frequency. But also take a look at the type two sound level meter where it goes actually to negative infinity as a tolerable error at 8,000 Hertz, uh, 12,500 for the type one meter. Basically, these devices are specced in such a way that they can have pretty much any response or no response at all once you get into these very high frequencies, which are actually pretty important to being able to capture an impulse. Now, many devices are going to perform better than this, but as far as what is specified and required under ANSI standards for this, uh, it is not as good as what you would like for the purposes of impulses. Uh, the table on the right hand side uh, identifies total accuracy within different frequency ranges and i'm not going to dwell on this point for very long but the main point is that in order to get your measurements accurate for impulses you are taking the errors that are tolerable for steady state noise or swept noise type measurements and adding to them uh, so the device is really not intended for this use it might work for some purposes but there's a, a pretty big caveat that should be attached to that uh, please advance uh, two more slides okay uh, sorry one go back one thank you um, as Don was just going through the uh, a different representation of the, the block diagram of a sound level meter, uh, pretty much any device or any stage of processing along the way should be considered as a potential source of error for capturing impulses. And differing systems, differing measurement circumstances will determine which of these factors is going to be the most important. Uh, please move on to the next slide. In addition to these, uh, there are some additional limitations that uh, should be considered. If you intend to take a look at the spectrum, uh, depending on the meter that you're using, that you might or might not have access to that information. If you are engaging in a logging process uh, where you want to get time, the, the amount of sound as a function of time in, in specified time intervals, not quite the same sampling process as what Don was just talking about, but how often are the data written to memory? Um, those logging rates can often be on the order of 50 milliseconds, which is great for steady state or continuous noise, uh, but it's an eternity when it comes to impulses. And then uh, also for many of the damage risk criteria that we use, uh, something that I'll be discussing in a few minutes, uh, you need actually access to the, the pressure waveform. So you need to record the AC output from the sound level meter. And now that's a whole new group of devices and, and circuit components that need to be evaluated for this purpose. And then finally on this slide, uh, we have some of that logging information for equivalent continuous level, think of it as an average level, or for the peaks for individuals that are exposed to high levels of sound. And I want to just draw your attention to the, the green line, where at approximately 146 or so decibels, uh, you have this straight line sitting across the top. Now, uh, if you're not aware of what's actually going on with your sound level meter or your noise dosimeter, which would meet a sound level meter specification, if you're not uh, familiar with what these limits are, you might conclude that the peak level of whatever that sound source is, in this case, it was, I think, at a firing range, uh, that the, the maximum level of the peak is around 146. That, that's not true. It's the device that is limited at 146. The sound levels are actually considerably higher. And if you're going to be making these measurements, you, it becomes really important to really have a, an intimate familiarity with the properties of the machine that you're using, the sound level meter. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
Uh, don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, but uh, our group did spend some time a few years ago comparing various sound level meters uh, to a lab standard or a more standard measurement system at multiple sound levels. Uh, what's pictured in the, the photograph is an AR-15 mounted onto a gun stand. And we positioned the sound level meter plus a parallel microphone for the uh, lab standard system at uh, sound levels of 170, 160, 150, and so on, all the way down to 130, just to see what the comparison was uh, across these devices and relative to a, a proper system. Um, now, the way that those results turn out, next slide, please, is that uh, when estimating the peak levels, the accuracy of, of some of the devices was reasonably good up to a certain point. Uh, for the particular device that we have represented here. It uh, matched up our total values from the lab standard system up to about 150. But if you take a look at 160 and 170 dB peaks, uh, notice that decline that is present there. Uh, this is the sort of clipping thing that Don was mentioning earlier. There's something in that system, whether it happens to be in the electronic part of it or the microphone part of it, probably the electronics, um, where once you get over a certain point, the estimates that you obtain are going to be off and potentially quite substantially. At 170, which is not out of range for anybody that would be measuring some uh, civilian rifles, uh, you might be off by as much as 15 decibels. And that is a substantial deviation if your primary interest is in the peak. Uh, it, next slide, please. Taking a look at some of the devices that are out there, uh, the Larson Davis LXT 831, a couple of the 824 models that we had access to, and then a 3M uh, Sound Pro device. You can see the errors uh, that are present here as the deviation between the colored symbols and the empty circles, which is where our lab standard uh, tended to sit. Um, main point is that at some point, the sound level meter is simply going to be overwhelmed by that sound. And you're going to, if peaks are the things that you're trying to measure, you're going to underestimate them. The question is not if, the question is where in that sound level range uh, that begins to occur. Uh, and it's important for you to realize that for some of these devices, if you're sending that signal out through that AC recording mechanism, uh, that might be actually where the problem is. The, the device display uh, could be sufficiently accurate, but by the time you get to the other parts that you need in order to characterize the hazard from that sound, uh, that's where the problem might be introduced. So it becomes complicated. And one of the challenges is that uh, there, under the circumstances where a sound level, might, a sound level meter might be used, you probably want to have established the accuracy of that against a lab-based or a lab standard system, uh, which starts to beg the question of, well, then why do the measurement twice uh, just in order to get to a handheld meter if you've got to duplicate it with a lab system? So that's one of the challenges that we're dealing with. Next slide, please. So the, the kinds of measurements that you need in order to avoid clipping and, and saturation uh, you need a low sensitivity mic, which is going to correspond to a higher frequency response, as Don was mentioning earlier. Uh, the preamplifier should have a pretty big capacity for a high voltage swing, something on the order of, of 50 volts, and just slightly lower than that for your analog to digital converter. Uh, now, it's possible to have uh, lower values than this, but it can introduce complications. Uh, having a range adjustment, for example, some of the data acquisition boards that we use give us the ability to go down actually beneath uh, a maximum dynamic range of one volt to a tenth of a volt to get really good resolution for low levels, and it can go up to 42 volts, uh, which would get us into the high level range. Uh, your SLU rate, uh, there are preamps from some companies that get you to 20 volts per microsecond. Other preamplifiers are limited to two. Uh, and if you're in that two range, it's not uncommon that uh, if you're dealing with impulses from firearms where the signal is just not gonna be followed no matter what microphone you have attached to that preamp. Um, oversampling, uh, Delta Sigma approaches, I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but your Delta Sigma uh, analog to digital converter is actually sampling at a much faster rate than the nominal sampling rate. 
so if you set it to have a sampling rate of 200 kilohertz, it might actually be sampling at 10 to 16 times that. And then uh, that nominal sampling rate needs to also be above the maximum frequency that you're looking for to get proper waveform resolution. Um, signal to noise ratio. Uh, for an impulse, you're dealing with something that has a massive signal to noise ratio to it. And depending on your uses, if you're going to be putting it into a damage risk criterion sort of model, you need some resolution of more than just that maximum level. So you need a pretty good quantization uh, for that converter. 24-bit is, is uh, something that I would lean toward. And then for subsequent data processing, be able to export this to a CSV file or some other numeric value. Take some care with WAV files because sometimes those will be automatically clipped at a voltage of our maximum value of one, even though the actual waveform uh, considerably exceeded that prior to that conversion into a WAV file. Uh, and then along the left-hand side, I want to just point out a trial run, no matter what the hardware is, getting some trial runs to look at the morphology of the waveform is crucially important. Um, when I talk about these sort of lab-based systems or desktop systems, uh, this is one example of that. This is something that was a, a sound level system for impulses that was developed by Chuck Cardis at NIOSH. And you can see that you've got a module, a computer, a power supply, microphones, and preamps associated with it. Another example of how that can look. Next slide. Oh, sorry, one more back. Oh, I see it's right there. Okay. Um, in the lower left-hand corner is another setup just using slightly different equipment. But again, you've got a computer to receive the data. Power supply is a little box on the in the middle on the right-hand side. And then the data acquisition chassis is the white sort of uh, rectangular faced thing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, switching over topics here into why it is that we're doing this in the first place. For many of us, it's in order to avoid the risk of hearing loss. And uh, just to kind of get us oriented away from the engineering aspects of it and the acoustics aspects of it, uh, if you have a substantial hearing impairment, that is causing you trouble in daily life. There's a burden associated with that, communication problems. In some cases, when the hearing uh, loss is pretty severe or the impairment is severe, you can run into psychosocial, economic uh, burdens, and then also increased rates of occupational injury. And right now, there's some information that's coming out having to do with longevity uh, associated with the, the hearing impairment rates. Um, the figure on the right, I'm going to uh, not spend a lot of time on right now, so I think let's go ahead and uh, advance one more slide. Um, I want to also characterize at the start of this, the difference between the term hazard and the term risk. Now, a hazard, something that would be considered hazardous, is an agent that would have a probability of harm that is greater than zero, no matter how far above zero that probability is. So it's based on this significant relationship between the exposure and whatever definition of harm it is that you happen to be using. In this case, it would be a, a hearing impairment that would uh, have an impact on your daily life. Uh, the definitions can vary though. Temporary threshold shift, in other words, a short-term uh, decline in your hearing sensitivity. Permanent threshold shift, which is a decline in hearing sensitivity that lasts. Uh, your frequency range of interest, are you only interested in the person's hearing through four kilohertz or is it eight kilohertz that you're most interested in? These things can lead to different answers. Uh, how much loss is too much? In other words, what kind of a shift uh, starts to impact the person's daily life? And then physiological effects can also take a, a role in here. So when you're characterizing hazard, you gotta ask, well, what are we trying to prevent in the first place? Risk on the other hand, is now the estimated probability of a specified degree of harm. In other words, uh, you define the harm uh, based on whatever it is that is of most interest uh, to you or, or from a policy standpoint. And what is that probability? What is your risk of that harm? So taking, for example, with OSHA, uh, there is a whole lot in the, the OSHA criteria that are based on a, a 512 or a 5124 average and then an average level of 25 decibels on an audiogram. Um, so with that, the risk of that harm 
is obviously driven by however it is that you define the harm. And if you're using these data and trying to come up with an estimate of, of the risk for that individual, there are some fundamental issues that you need to be familiar with uh, when you do that. And it's gonna change based on your environment. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the damage risk criteria or DRC area is uh, essentially the relationship between the exposure that a person might have on one hand and then that risk of harm as it's defined in the, on the other hand. Now, there are three main types. The first one of these is based on waveform parameters, in other words, peak and duration, for example. You don't need to uh, get into the fine details of that, that waveform. You just take one parameter, the peak, another parameter, the duration. And uh, this kind of waveform parameter-based damage risk criteria is one of the earliest that was developed because it requires the least instrumentation. Next slide, please. Another type that's out there is based on integrated energy, where you basically filter the waveform, for example, A weighting, and then you calculate the, the average level or the RMS level. And then a third type, next slide, is a mathematical model uh, where you've got essentially numeric representations of different aspects of the auditory system, and you're trying to predict at the level of the inner ear uh, what it is that can reach the outer ear in order to reach that level of harm. Each of these kinds of damage risk criteria, next slide, are present uh, in a number of rules that can be used right now. Uh, so taking a look through this, it's a bit of a walk through history, but you can see that like the first few of these are based on parameters. Uh, LAEQ in 1983, that's an integrated A-weighted sound energy, so applying the filtering that Don mentioned earlier. And then some of the other models that are out there, AHA and ICE, for example, uh, those are the computational models uh, that I mentioned just a moment ago, the mathematics, mathematic or complex models. Uh, the bottom line that's down here, kurtosis adjusted LAEQ is something that Bill mentioned at the beginning. It's an integrated A-weighted energy, but then you adjust based on that temporal envelope, how much kurtosis there is in order to come up with your estimate of, of potential risk. Next slide, please. And one of the challenges that we have in this area is that these rules uh, do not necessarily agree with respect to the allowable number of rounds or the maximum permissible exposures. Those are the ANOR and MPE values in this table. So throwing it out as an example, if you take a look at the 50 dB A-weighted hour or eight hour equivalent continuous level, uh, peak is somewhere on the order of 133. And uh, for the ICE model under one version of it, that would allow you seven rounds or seven exposures during the course of your day. Uh, if you go to the Chava way over on the right-hand side, uh, that, one, that rule would tell you you could have 102,000 during the course of the day. Now, the challenge that we face is uh, one of, well, they both can't, they can't both be right. Um, somewhere in there is the truth. And we don't, at this point, actually know which rule returns the truth and how to actually uh, manage that. But depending on the work environment in which you happen to be, uh, you might be compelled to use one rule or another, uh, or you might uh, have a, a degree of choice that is afforded to you. Next slide. But it's not all bad news. Uh, these rules uh, actually do agree with one another in some respects. They're very highly correlated. What we're looking at right here is a study that we did, uh, including just shy of 5,000 uh, impulses, where we are generating a scatter plot of the allowable numbers of rounds across all these damage risk criteria. And, and you can see that they're very strongly related to one another, which means, next slide, uh, that you are capable of predicting the outcome of one other metric based on some source metric. So the Chaba 1968 and some derivative uh, damage risk criteria for it is very commonly used, certainly in the US military. And it is possible for you to take something that was based, uh, a number of rounds that is based on Chaba and transform it into LAEQ and other ones because there's such a strong relationship there. So even though the allowable number of rounds can be different, uh, it is possible to know what the allowable number of rounds would be for the other, uh, for a, a different DRC based on your knowledge of, the, of a separate DRC. Uh, next slide, please. And so when you take a look at uh, the data from this study where we compare these different damage risk criteria for the same kinds of impulsive recordings, 
uh, the accuracy, which is what's plotted on the right-hand side, the interquartile range of values in log units, correspond to something on the order of a two decibel predictive error uh, if you are starting from some other damage risk criterion. Uh, now, that's really important to keep in mind because if you know these relationships, it is possible for you to actually come up with a prediction uh, that if you're starting with solid data would be reasonably accurate uh, and might actually be more accurate than you measuring it yourself with the equipment that you might have in place. And these strong relationships, looking at the left-hand lower left figure, the, the proportion of the variance explained is uh, well above 0.8 in most cases. In other words, you can predict with really good accuracy uh, what some of these sounds are gonna be under certain circumstances. And there's a lot to like about that. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna hand this back to Don to wrap up. Uh, I know that we're a little bit short on time, so I'll let him pick up from here. Just briefly, what we've covered was a lot of information, obviously, and a lot of it did center on issues relative to how can you control sound and how can we protect, as well as technical issues with measuring sound and the implications of that. Uh, basically what we've covered is that, and kind of conclude, is that sound level meters are not a replacement for a field research system for measuring impulsive noise. Um, it's the specifications for the equipment, including for the microphone itself, um, are necessary. We have to have adequate specifications, but not sufficient itself. The preamplifier itself, the AC output might be coming from a system of recording apparatus must all be able to handle the impulse signal, not just the microphone, but all those components of that measurement system. The display from a sound level meter is not the same thing as the AC output of the uh, sound level meter in terms of its dynamic range. Those are, are two different things uh, related to that same measurement. Accuracy declines with increasing level. When in the measurements we found, we did find that a number of sound level meters clipped, and that was at the 150, 160, 170 dB range, and that clipping provided uh, a underestimation of the data itself. So use of commercial sound level meters utilized for impulse noise may underestimate auditory hazard for impulse sound levels once we get up to around 150 dB um, peak SPL. The new, if we use an eighth inch microphone for a sound level meter, it might not actually fix things, however, because you're still dealing with issues related to the slew rate and the dynamic range of the preamplifier, the gain amplifier as well itself. It's not gonna fix it. Sound level meter instrument specifications may need to specify the accuracy and range for specific outputs and specific impulse levels once you're talking about those overall levels. Considering these potential limitations, you might not know what you're missing. If you didn't know that you clipped a signal, you wouldn't know that you underestimated, for example. And maybe it's better not to measure versus having inaccurate measurements so you don't provide a, a uh, DRC um, value essentially that would be uh, relative to data that is too low, uh, inaccurately low. So, what questions do you have? I know we are short of time, but if we do have some questions, feel free to put something in the chat window and we can address it here or we can maybe even address it later. As you guys are doing that, I'm just gonna mention real briefly, we talked about the Rudyard work group um, overall. There's a number of other people involved in that group besides just the three of us who are here. Um, and we started that group in 2008. I wasn't actually part of it at that time. A number of us weren't. But the key members involved in the Rudyard work are Bill Murphy, Greg Flammy, myself, Dana Meinke, James Langford, Mike Stewart, Stephen Tasco. So a number of other researchers as well have been working on the uh, the gunshot noise measurements and other high level impulse noise measurements um, overall. I'm going to end it here. Uh, Bill mentioned the noise manual, which just came, just came out. It has, oh, there it is. You got your own copy, Bill. Nice. Yeah, it's nice that they gave you a copy for writing it. And our uh, email addresses Rick's are here as well if you guys would like to contact us later on um, for more, further information. <clears throat> 
It really is a, a, a wonderful resource. I had the opportunity in January to teach a, a portion of a course for industrial hygienists on noise and managed to go through about four or five chapters of, of the noise manual. There's a lot of information in here. And, uh, it just begins to touch on some of these things. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy, this topic of impulse noise is just not an easy thing to, to deal with. There's a, I would say there are a lot of things that, that each of us are learning as we're going through this. And, you know, you would think, oh, well, the PhD should know all this. Nope, we don't. I did send uh, Jessica the, the uh, revised version of the slides without the duplicate slides and uh, a few spelling errors that were in there that we, we fixed. But if I'd be curious, you know, I think Art, we met you last time and the, or I met you at the, the last um, webinar last week. And I don't know if others would like to come off uh, Come off mute and just tell us you know, what what do you do and how do you think this might be useful to you? Nobody wants to speak. All right. Well, thank you for attending. Yes, thank you to uh, Greg, Bill, and Don for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. Um, and everyone keep an, e keep an eye out for an email from me with the slides and um, the evaluation link. And like they said, you can contact them with any questions you have in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye.